continuing in Swift Rivers by Cornelia Meigs. We're on chapter seven. Chapter seven is titled The Yellow Giant. As he choked and struggled in the muddy creek water, Chris felt that his lungs must burst before he could wrench himself free of the clutching arms and the supple legs which wrapped about him and sought to drown him. The water of the pool was churned to yellow foam in the furious battle which went on in grim silence between these two, who had not yet even seen each other's face. Once, Chris tore himself loose for an instant and came to the surface to draw a tremendous breath and catch a fleeting glimpse of the stars and of the great hulk of the walnut log towering over him. Then he went down again, with that strangling weight still clinging to his taut body. An Indian's life of hunting, running, and riding makes him tough and nimble, yet his training is no more rigorous than that of a boy who works early and late upon a wilderness farm. A red man's great strength and power is in his legs, for his arms do heavy labor, or for his arms do no heavy labor and are less developed than his thighs and tremendously powerful knees. But a farmer's lad toils with every muscle of his body. Day after day and year after year, he becomes hard as iron and with his wits to help him is a match for any other dweller in the wilderness, whether it be a steel pawed bear, a blindly infuriated bull moose, or a more human adversary. Every swing of the long scythe with which Chris had cut the grain in Nels Anderson's fields had toughened the fiber of his strong young body and stood him now in good stead in his desperate extremity. Again, he came to the surface and could at last see the dark, tense face of his enemy emerge from the water not two feet away. They caught deep, sobbing breaths, the two of them, but neither cried out. Chris could have called to Stuart for aid, but his shout would have brought the whole Indian village to the rescue of their comrade. Why the other did not lift his voice to summon his friends was a matter upon which the boy wasted no thought. It was probable that, having let the log slip away under his very eyes, he had no wish to bring his companions to witness his undoing. He must get them back alone or lose them utterly. To an Indian, nothing is so terrible as humiliation before his brother warriors. He will gladly perish rather than endure that. As the pair struggled in the water, they drifted slowly with the stream, the big walnut tree moving serenely beside them. At one moment, Chris had caught one of the spruce trunks alongside it and dragged himself head and shoulders out of the water, but the great mass careened and plunged him under again. The boy could feel the tug of the current as the force of the creek began to strengthen. He had clutched his enemy now about his slippery naked body and was attempting in his turn to force him downward but with no other result than that he went plunging himself to the very bottom of the pool. Now they had come to a shallow bar where both could set their feet upon the ground. Here was waged a panting, wrestling battle. First one getting the mastery and then the other. Suddenly Chris heard a shout on the bank behind them. The second Indian had returned and was calling to his comrade. At the same moment, he heard Stuart, finally attracted by the distant sounds of the struggle in the water, come running and splashing up the margin of the stream. Chris made one tremendous effort to thrust the Indian below the surface, then gave ground a little and found that he was standing in water scarcely up to his knees, with hard stone instead of mud under his feet. He had come to the ledge where, over which the current poured swiftly to plunge into the pool below. He was still crushing the ribs of his foe in, mercilessly, in merciless embrace, but the Indian was forcing him back, backward. The rapid water snatched at such insecure footing as he could find. He was thrust one pace farther. His feet fumbled for a purchase and found nothing as he went backward over the ledge. At the same instant, he saw the vast log catch and swing on the verge of the fall, then rear up tremendous and staggering in the pouring current. It rolled over sideways and came crashing down into the deep pool. It scarcely more than brushed against Chris. Yet the impetus of its fall was so great that it flung him outward, clear of the rocks and ledges into still water. He came to the surface, swimming dizzily, drawing great gasps of grateful breath. As his empty lungs filled, <clears throat> something moved heavily under the water and touched his knee. It was the inert body of the Indian who had been struck fairly by the wallowing log and knocked into insensibility. Chris dragged him to the margin of the pool where Stuart was already waiting waist deep to meet him. His friend asked no questions but added his aid to the exhausted effort Chris was making to draw his enemy from the water. He's still breathing. 
pronounced Stuart, stooping down to lay his ear in the man's chest. They left him sprawled upon the mud, half in and half out of the water. Down the stream, the walnut tree was sailing in slow majesty after the rest of the lost timbers to join them as they rolled and jostled their way to the mouth of the creek. Since no pursuit followed, it might be surmised that a startled brave rushed into the Indian encampment to declare that the spirits of the river had desired the white men to keep their property after all, and had laid violent hands upon one of the watchers. The Mississippi had taken back the tempting prize which they had sought to make their own. Of a bullet and three moccasins, there was probably nothing said. The men on the rafts, sleeping uneasily in the smother of the hot night, were aroused before dawn by the boys' shout alongside. Turn out to help us. The logs are in the river. They jumped up and came to the edge of the water, a blinking and astounded company. We thought you'd left us for good, declared Ned Kelly, and gone downstream with the raft that went by yesterday. Except for taking our boat, you would have been in your rights if you had. We, owed, we owned it amongst us last night, that you'd done more than any of the rest of us, and that you'd had more to make you lose heart. More than a mile downstream, a new boom was laid out from the shore, and behind it, the fugitive wealth of Chris Dahlberg and Shreve McLeod was finally gathered. Activities were transferred from the sandbar to the place where the logs had been caught, and here they were bored, bolted, and bound once more into a new braille to lie under armed guard and to be picked up when the rest of the raft should be once more afloat. Axes and hammers were wielded with a will as the last of the frames were set together. On Lone Tree Bar, the whole broken section of the raft lying at the edges of the water had now been cut free. The floating timbers were once more set in orderly array, butt to butt, within the new framework, just as they had been before they met with misadventure. There remained now only the stranded bow portion of the raft, which the first impact had pushed high up on the bar to be buried, unbroken in the soft sand. This must somehow be dragged free. The moment had arrived for following Pierre Dumanel's detailed description of putting down a dead man. The relief of knowing that the labor of reconstruction was in its last phase had seemed to be a work had seemed to work a miracle among the men. The shovels flew as the deep trench was dug on the shore, a hundred feet above the bar. A big trunk of slippery elm was cut down and laid at the bottom. They could not spare a single one out of the number of the stamped and measured logs which they had worked so hard to save. The green, coarse wood of the elm would serve their purpose just as well. A strong line was fastened about the center of the trunk, while all along the trench crossed stakes were laid, resting against the rough bark of the tree. Then the heavy sand was shoveled in and piled in a heap above it. If you pull that out, the whole bottom of the river ought to come up with it, Jacob Wolf declared. Chris, used, used to the hard granite of his own valley, could scarcely be convinced of the staying power of shifting the sand. But presently, he was obliged to believe the evidence of his own eyes. The long, heavy line was carried over to the cross piece of the raft, which lay so deeply settled in the sand that it seemed it must rest on the bar forever. Four windlasses were connected by smaller lines to the big hauser, and the slow labor of winding up began. The sun was clear and merciless, as though even this last effort must be made as difficult as possible, as though heat and toil were bound to pursue the venture to the very end. There were three men at each windlass, struggling and sweating and forcing the heavy handle around and around. The ropes squeaked and tightened. The timbers began to groan. Once, a clumsy fellow missed his hold. His rope unwound and the handle spun in murderous fury, threatening destruction to everything near. But that was a mishap long familiar to river hands. The three windless men all sprang clear the instant that the slipping of the line gave them warning. Amidst the cheerful jeers of their comrades, they bent to their work again and wound up their rope to an even tautness with the rest. Once more, the heavy log frames complained aloud as the terrific strain grew heavier and heavier. There was a strange quiver under the workers' feet, a soft, gigantic sucking sound, and all of a sudden, the whole mass of timber was floating easily upon the ripples, which washed Lone Tree Bar. A shout went up, followed by relieved, almost hysterical laughter. Ned Kelly's crew had accomplished what seemed the utterly impossible. There were no words of congratulation offered either to the pilot or to those two helpers whose aid had been so great. 
The custom of the river did not permit any effusion of feeling, no matter what the occasion. But the face of the young Irishman who had brought the craft aground upon the bar and who now saw it afloat again was a thing long to be remembered. Joy shone upon that homely countenance with brightness to warm the heart of any man. I never thought to see it, he said to the two boys who stood behind him, or beside him. You, his voice came very near to Branky, you can't know what it will mean to me to take her into St. Louis after all. It was after they were fairly launched and actually moving down with the current that Ned Kelly added a last word to Chris. I always wanted to tell you what I felt about about them logs being yours, but I never could find any words for it. I knew you would come to understand sometime. The boy nodded. He did understand now. The last strip was picked up. The whole great structure was firmly lashed together and the voyage southward was finally begun. It seemed that luck had decided to make common cause with them at last, for that heat lifted and a cool wind blew straight downstream to waft them onward. A few skulking Indians had peered out at them as they picked up the recovered braille of logs, those straight pine stems, those rich cedar logs which would have made such glorious canoes, that fabulously big trunk of walnut. But the red men made no offer to recapture what had once seemed so safe in their own hands. They appeared to believe that the will of the great river had decided the matter otherwise. One hazard still lay before them, a totally unexpected one. As they came round a bend, borne by both current and wind, there appeared before them a little island, softly covered with new willow growth. Ned Kelly stared at it in amazement. That island wasn't there last season, he declared. The current and the channel swerved here and almost directly across the river, so that the raft must turn also and make the long crossing from bank to bank and at right angles to the wind. They moved forward easily, rocking the short waves running under the raft and showing their undulations from one side to the other. Chris saw Ned Kelly's face grow anxious. The man was upon his mettle now, if ever he was to be in his life. Nevertheless, it was suddenly plain that they were drifting down upon the island. The great length of the raft was halfway past the little dot of land. The wind freshened all at once in a fitful puff. Down they slipped, nearer and nearer. It seemed that the long, slender line of the raft would be snapped across the head of the island as a stick is snapped across a man's knee. Chris saw Kelly's hand quiver on the steering sweep, but he gave no order to the men to swing the great oars. Steady on, Cap, he heard Cono Blends whisper. The current's carrying us faster than the wind. A long, agonizing minute, and they were passed, with the rear corner of the raft cutting a groove in the sand at the point of the island. If Ned Kelly had tried to swing his great craft, he would have plunged it to irreparable destruction. It was the current that saved us, Cono Blends remarked when they were safely by. It's a brave man, Ned, that can just leave it to the river when he has to. The river can do you a good turn as well as a bad one. But Ned Kelly repeated indignantly when the speck of green was well behind them. But I tell you, that island wasn't there last year. Nor won't be next year, most likely, returned O'Blins. It will be just washed away to form again somewhere else. It's only one of the little tricks the river likes to play to teach young pilots their business. Ned Kelly reddened, but took the joke in good part. You'll be running a raft yourself some day, Con, he declared. But the cheerful cook shook his head. Not me, he said with feeling. Let the river have her ways and me have mine. I'll take no responsibility when I'm traveling along with the Mississippi. Other difficulties were, there were of bars and crossings, but for the most part, the channel grew ever wider and deeper. There seemed nothing to do now but to wait and float, to float and wait as the days went by. As they slid steadily southward, Chris began to have some strange misgivings. His enterprise had passed many dangers. Could he not perhaps believe that the little green tufted island had been the last menace of which he need to be afraid? The enmity of Uncle Nell's, the narrow shallows of the Goosewing, the brawling rapids of the Mississippi, the human hazard of quarrels and inexperience and loss of heart. Were not all these enough? But now there must lie before him the new experience and the new risk of bringing his wares to market.